Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight Existential Hope podcast. It's really nice to see a few of our visitors here with us, kind of like backstage, I guess. Um, and this podcast, just to you know, give people a bit of a reminder, is not a, like our usual technical seminars, but it's really um, just to take uh, kind of like a look out and see what could be available in the very, very long run and inspire people um, to perhaps pursue uh, a career or two uh, in these areas or to at least uh, get inspired, read up, learn a little bit about what uh, the long-term future could hold in store for us. And we're really excited to be joined by Adam Brown today. Um, uh, Adam Brown, you're a theoretical uh, physicist at Stanford. Uh, you're interested in early universe cosmology and uh, inflation black holes and assorted other topics. So it says your bio, and I hope we can dive a little bit into some of them. But you also wrote a really wonderful popular article for the Scientific American about mining black holes. And, and that was um, the discussion topic, um, uh, or turned out to be the, one of the main discussion topics in a recent interview that we had with Kieran Levitt, who is also here in the audience, uh, who is chairing our space tech group. Um, and notably, I think our last like in-person uh, encounter of course at YSF Youth was at Vision Weekend, um, when we discussed long-term goals uh, for each other's respective research fields. And uh, I remember you saying that uh, you're worried about dynamics around the end of the universe, um, with your goal being to escape the heat death of the universe, uh, also the goal of that field. And at Fawcett, I think we often get at least pointed out as having a particularly long view, but that really is quite a long-term view. And so I'm really, really happy to have you here to discuss uh, more long-term topics with you. But perhaps we start at the beginning um, and maybe to bring people up to speed, um, could you perhaps describe in your own words a little bit what you, it is that you're working on um, and also perhaps what got you started? So if it was the uh, Adam Brown story, life story in three minutes or so, um, what, uh, what could other folks uh, make of your trajectory? What got you into your field um, and what is it that you are currently focused on? Thank you, Alison. I, yeah, so I'm a theoretical physicist um, interested in fundamental physics. So that means quantum mechanics, gravity, how to meld quantum mechanics and gravity. And that touches on a number of other topics, including cosmology, Big Bang, uh, very distant future of the universe, uh, quantum computing, uh, geometry of high dimensional spaces, uh, classical computing, um, and various other things in that domain. So one of the great things about being a theoretical physicist is that uh, unlike an experimental physicist is you don't have lab equipment that needs to be reconfigured. So you can just reconfigure your brain and work on a number of different topics and uh, be relatively light on your feet. Um, but yeah, th that's the kind of topics that I tend to think about. Um, and I had a sort of relatively uncomplicated arc to get there. I just was always a somewhat bookish boy growing up in Oxford, uh, went to the local university to read philosophy and physics, and then moved to America for grad school and have gone between various academic institutions doing, uh, doing theoretical physics uh, all the way. Oh, I had no idea that you even grew up in Oxford. That's crazy. I did, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, wonderful. Um, well, I remember once we had Andrew Sandberg on for a similarly uh, like XOP um, podcast, and he basically said that one of the most hopeful things uh, that I think he can imagines uh, he can he, he imagines doing is actually being in Oxford and diving into the libraries there. And so, in terms of that, you were a bookish boy and growing up in Oxford, I'm I'm hoping that that got you somewhat XOP uh, aligned as well. Uh, but okay, that's um um. Uh, that's an interesting, I think, trajectory and I think relatively straightforward. So perhaps you could uh, bring people a little bit up to speed on, um, you know, what it is that you're working on. So if someone, you know, was entering the space of physics and potentially even like cosmology uh, up front, how can, like, what is kind of like the map of the space and so far as there is there is a map? So in modern theoretical physics, many different lines of thought are all coming together. So from the cosmology point of view, the history of the field has been pushing our understanding, well, both backwards in time and forwards in time, but from the backwards in time point of view, sort of closer and closer and closer to the, the Big Bang um, or the singularity that appears that have happened in our past. 
Um, and, you know, first people understood back to 300,000 years after the Big Bang, which was an important event because it was when the universe became, uh, went from being opaque to being translucent. Uh, and then, then to sort of three minutes, which is when the elements were made. And people just kind of keep pushing those ideas back and back and back. And it, so one can, like a historian, characterize oneself with a time scale. And so in a very early universe, you know, we now basically understand back to well sub second time scales after the notional Big Bang. Um, and so in order to understand those time scales, we need to understand, you know, how to combine these two great theories of. 20th century physics, gravity, which was extremely operative at the Big Bang. It was very much described by Einstein's general relativity. That's that's the context in which we understand that. And quantum mechanics. Um, quantum mechanics is the theory of, you know, that most pertains at the very smallest scales, but uh, the universe in those days was absolutely minuscule. Um, you know, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you go back in time. And so that was the time at which both gravity and quantum mechanics were operative. And so that sort of connects, you know, we're forced to contend with a whole bunch of questions that were, um, you know, seemingly purely theoretical about how to combine these topics or only involve thought experiments about black holes. So um, in terms of cosmology, that's where we're at. And then in terms of, or well, there's also thought experiments about black holes and, uh, and various other topics. Okay, can you say more just about the singularity that uh, apparently occurred into our, in our past? Yeah, well, this was one of the um, surprising discoveries. Um, it's sort of an implication of, or at least a natural consequence of Einstein's theory of gravity is general relativity, but one that Einstein missed, I would say. Um, and he, he sort of didn't like it from a philosophical point of view. Uh, so he rejected this conclusion of his theory, but the conclusion seems to be correct, which is if you look out in the universe today, uh, all of the galaxies are moving away from us, except the very close ones. And the further they are away, uh, the more they're faster they're moving away from us. And if you just sort of play the tape backwards for 13.8 billion years, it looks like all the galaxies are in the same place. Uh, and that's the Big Bang. And so, um, you know, that, that's sort of compelling uh, theoretical evidence with Hubble and many other people starting in the uh, beginning of the last century. And uh, a big project in cosmology is just to understand, you know, uh, the, the physics as you get closer and closer to the Big Bang, everything just gets hotter and hotter and hotter and uh, more intense and more quantum mechanical and all these various other things. So trying to understand that, it gets sort of harder and harder and harder the closer you get to the Big Bang. And that's one of the big projects. Um, and one of the, there was a great experiment uh, about uh, WMAP, it was called, and, and before that, um, after that Planck, and before that, there was some other, another satellite experiment where they send satellites up and look at the, uh, imprint of the, the Big Bang, what's called the cosmic microwave background on, on the background. And uh, just which is just in any direction you look in space, you see this faint buzz at, uh, at a few degrees Kelvin. And by reading the patterns in that buzz, we have learned a fantastic amount that we, you know, when these people first wrote down these theories, some of these theories in the 1970s and 80s, they would, you know, they would include caveats, well, of course, we'll never actually see this. Um, and yet we've seen it, you know, we built these cryogenic satellites, we went up and looked at it, and now we've seen these kind of echoes of the Big Bang, from which one can infer a huge amount of information uh, about what was going on at the very earliest moments. Okay, wonderful. And uh, you already referenced, and uh, I think Einstein in there, but have there been uh, in your field, uh, as least as, you know, as far as your, um, like a, perhaps like a product of, uh, of also a different culture shift, have there been significant culture shifts, like have like, um, e either culture shift in terms of like what kind of theories have been, um, yeah, have been, um, have been, uh, have been become okay to believe in the Omerton window, uh, but also in terms of like actual conceptual shifts, um, really that kind of like turned the whole of physics or cosmology really upside down. Like, have there been any such notable historic events where we really had to like kind of scrap everything that we that we uh, believed at that point in time, and then uh, we had to kick uh, kickstart a new theory. 
there have been a number Oh, I think uh, I can't hear you anymore. Or of shifts like that, Deslix is done. There okay, have been now you're back. Can you hear me now? There have been shifts, uh, shifts in the way that physics is done, um, involving information technology and the archive, which is this internet, uh, which has revolutionized uh, the sort of mechanics of doing physics. Um, and physicists were the inventors and very early adopters of these uh, internet preprint repositories, which just kind of revolutionized uh, the mechanics of spreading ideas within physics. So that's been a big cultural shift. In terms of big discoveries, I would say one of, from the point of view of uh, long-term cosmology, one of the biggest discoveries was in 1997, the discovery of the cosmological constant. And that, while compatible with Einstein's theories, was another one of those ideas that Einstein uh, rejected out of hand and uh, was somewhat astonishing, uh, first of all, that the cosmological constant was there. If you read papers from the 70s and uh, 80s, people writing about the long-term future of the universe, uh, they just kind of assumed, you know, Freeman Dyson had this famous uh, uh, life in an open universe paper that I would say was sort of a sort of visionary foresight style uh, exploration of, of how our distant, distant ancestors might live. And in retrospect, knowing what we do now, completely irrelevant, um, just, uh, well, probably completely irrelevant um, because it didn't uh, understand that we had a positive, cos didn't know that we had a positive cosmological constant, which changes everything. This was this big discovery looking at distant supernova um, in 1997. Uh, for which Nobel Prizes were awarded. And um, for the, from one point of view, I mean, this was a big discovery, but from another point of view, it was sort of the worst discovery we ever made, um, which is uh, in terms of, you know, our future happiness of our descendants, potentially, uh, you might imagine that the worst discovery that we ever made, uh, most depressing discovery we ever made, but maybe, maybe I should tell you what the cosmological constant is. It's this um, uh, field, sometimes called dark energy, still not understood at all uh, and only observed in its effects on the expansion of the universe, which causes the expansion of the universe, which up to that moment was believed to be while it was expanding, the expansion was slowing down. Uh, it's actually observed that the expansion of the universe is not slowing down. It's in fact accelerating, it's speeding up. Uh, the universe is, is expanding ever faster uh, by some same metric. And um, the reason that's depressing is that um, if you have very distant galaxies that are about you know, 10 uh, billion light years away, um, we kind of like to, you know, maybe meet the people who uh, live there or maybe harvest their resources. And in a universe that was slowing down, we could do that at our leisure. We could just mosey on over there whenever we felt like it and uh, uh, use the resources in those distant galaxies. Unfortunately, the cosmological constant telling us that the universe is expanding um, at an ever accelerating rate says, no, we don't have forever to do that. Uh, we've got to leave now, basically, if we want to go get some of those galaxies. And for many of those galaxies, it's too late. We'll never get them. Uh, since we're confined to move at the speed of light, uh, they're just going to be ripped away from us by the expansion of the universe, and we'll never see them again. So in terms of what, well, in that case, experimental cosmology taught us about our long-term future, that was maybe the most revolutionary uh, point. Um, Sort of, in many ways, bad news, but maybe, uh, well, maybe not, but it certainly uh, seemed like bad news. Um, I do think that, that that discovery should sort of induce, in theoretical physicists, some humility um, about making plans for the very long term, uh, insofar as, uh, you know, I, I maybe would be tempted to describe what we should be doing in tens of billions of years, but any advice given before 1997 is basically null and void uh, because of the discovery of the positive cosmological constant. So if I'm giving you advice for tens of billions of years, but, but tell you that the physics that underlies this was completely revolutionary only 25 years ago, maybe that's an indication that uh, uh, we should have some humility about making long-term predictions. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting um, paper on um, astronomical weights that was one of Boston's very early papers on how much I think a human 
uh, brain and related subjective life years we are losing by delaying um, colonizing the universe uh, per second. And so we try to calculate this. Um, and probably many of the assumptions that we made even in that paper are probably also uh, outdated somewhat uh, in terms of how fast can you, can you emulate humans uh, and so forth. But, but nevertheless, like uh, that opportunity cost is, I think, um, is at least appreciated by a few people. <laughs> um, Okay, cool. So um, I think one thing, you know, maybe take it, um, like take take it back from like the beginning um, um, of the universe to like really the the far end. I think uh, one interesting thing, really, at the Vision Weekend panel that we had you on, uh, was uh, that you know you kind of like tongue in cheek, but nevertheless said uh, you know potential end goal could be escaping the heat death uh, of the universe. Um, and so I guess I just wanted to you know um, dive into that a little bit more. Could you just describe what the heat of the universe like actually uh, entailed on the very, very, very long one? When can we expect to hit that? And obviously we take it with a grain of salt because uh, probably everything that we know by now will have, may have been superseded in the next 25 years. But nevertheless, as far as we currently know, um, what is this heat death of the universe that we're escaping? And then maybe we can afterwards talk a little bit about uh, strategies. <laughs> Yes. So, um, yeah, what is the heat death? What is the heat? Forget about uh, the universe for a start. What, what is the heat? Heat death is when you've used up all of your free energy. Um, and so this can be true in a, in a system that the usable energy, uh, free energy is actually a sort of technical term. It means the usable energy in a system. Um, and if you kind of want to do anything ever, you need to use, uh, you burn free energy typically. Um, so if you uh, want to, you know, lift a weight. There's a whole field called thermodynamics that says if you want to have, if you want to be able to do that, um, you need to be able to extract uh, usable, useful, low entropy energy from the universe in order to do work. Um, and and that you know because the inspiration for thermodynamics was 19th century steam engines. It's often expressed in those those language, but we could express it in more 21st century terms. If you want to do useful computation, if you want to error correct, for example, your computations, uh, you, you're going to need to do, uh, you need free energy to do that. Otherwise, we just end up in thermal equilibrium. Nothing interesting happens. It's just a sea of constant temperature, everything, and there's no gradients to take advantage of. Okay, so this is, this is a somewhat depressing prospect. Um, and people talked about whether that would happen before 1997, but 1997 really threw it into perspective. Um, if the, here is a theorem, if the cosmological constant really is constant, and the laws of physics as we currently understand them are correct, we only have a limited amount of free energy. Why? Because, well, we only have a certain number of galaxies uh, within our visible universe. And um, we can disassemble those and extract all the free energy, but you can't, for any given galaxy, extract more than a finite amount of free energy. The, there's a sort of background temperature, um, which is the heat bath, which is this, um, which is set by the uh, quantum expansion of the universe, and so you just have a certain amount of energy at a certain uh, minimum temperature, and you can run the calculations, and we only have a certain amount of free energy. Now, it's rather a lot. The numbers are pretty, high, you know, they're 10 to something, like 100-ish. Um, amounts of free energy that we have to play with, but it's not uh, infinite, which is kind of a, a shame if you were hoping for an infinite future. So that, that's and just the theory. Getting constant. less every minute, right? Getting less every minute. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, it's just getting the situation is getting worse and worse. Um, so that's a theorem. If we uh, if we cannot evade the cosmological constant, then our long term future is uh, to end in a heat death after some finite amount of computation, some finite amount of uh, uh, processing and utility has been released. So uh, from the point of view of fundamental physics, uh, you know, that is the number one obstruction we, want, we have to overcome if we uh, want to uh, <clears throat> you know, live forever and, and have an infinite amount of utility in the future. So, this is sort of uh, both sort of uplifting and depressing at the, at the same time. You know, theoretical physics, thinking about the long-term future, is often quite uplifting, um, just because of the amount it's willing to abstract away as mere engineering problems. Um, it, you know, once you've established that something's not forbidden by the laws of physics, then the 
theoretical physics instinct is just to say that it's a solved problem, or at least a soluble problem, and nothing to be worried about. So the theoretical physicist is, is likely to say, you know, any of these uh, more mundane problems, or even just engineering problems are, are not big problems. The only big problem uh, that, that from a theoretical physics point of view presents itself is this heat death of the universe. And so then the question is, Um, okay, we'll continue about it. Um, yeah. And um, to a certain extent, laws of, the laws of physics being cooperative. Um, so uh, what we'd have to do is hope that the cosmological constant, uh, which we just called a constant, that doesn't mean it necessarily is a constant, it looks constant to us, but is not in fact a constant, that it's in fact subject to, our, it's, we're able to manipulate it um, in some way. And, and the good news is that in many extensions of physics, as we currently understand them, um, in many very plausible extensions, the cosmological constant can be manipulated. Um, we can either change it either discreetly or continuously. A sufficiently advanced civilization could do that. And a sufficiently advanced civilization could bleed off the cosmological constant in many plausible extensions of, uh, of the, the things that are absolutely established. So for example, the theory that I think about uh, often in the context of trying to quantize gravity is string theory, um, which is a seemingly self-consistent uh, extension of the observed laws of physics. And if string theory is correct, and um, then there doesn't seem to be any fundamental obstruction to us manipulating the cosmological constant once we get strong enough as a civilization um, and either inducing vacuum decay or just leading off the cosmological constant and just uh, taking it down from its current positive troublesome value towards zero. And if we could just smoothly take it down towards zero, uh, then all would not be lost. We would uh, be able to control the expansion of the universe and sort of recover Dyson's original optimistic take uh, that assumed that there was no cosmological constant. In fact, it would be even somewhat better than that, because if we had full control over the cosmological constant, we could uh, actually extract energy from the cosmological constant itself as we, as we bled down uh, the laws of physics, uh, as we bled down the, the cosmological constant. And the good news is that there's nothing, you know, the most plausible extension of the, of the laws of physics we have in, that does have the cosmological constant be manipulatable. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I think that there is the, um, is it called the final question? Do you know that, um, that short story? I think it's by Asimov, right? Um, we're just trying to tackle this question. Yeah, I think it's, it's called the final question. Um, and uh, it's basically uh, asking about uh, solving this uh, very, very far future problem uh, through AI. And the AI uh, is always um, wondering, that, or it's always pondering that it never has enough data to answer this question. And then uh, I'm not going to give the prompt away, but uh, for for folks interested in solving this problem, I think this is a very hopeful, uh, at least a hopeful story around it. Um, okay, wonderful. I think you know we're really drilling uh, into the existential hope part uh, of the interview as well. So usually what we do is um, you know I'll do a little bit of introduction just on what it is that people are currently working on, and then I'll hand it over to Beatrice uh, to talk a little bit more about the actual existential hope scenarios. And I think you're already uh, really I think. Um, drilling into one there uh, of what it could mean uh, to escape the death of the universe, uh, including bleeding off the cosmological constant. So I think that's a good time for me to hand over and perhaps we can drill down a little bit more into how to get there. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for joining us in this little experiment, Adam, uh, and for, you know, trying to make what you're doing uh, a bit more accessible to people who might not be fully into the field uh, and to, so what we're trying to do is like communicate how the work that scientists like yourself are doing uh, and how that actually can help us, you know, create a better future. Um, so the first question that I have for you is slightly more of a philosophical one. That's uh, if you have a positive vision for the future, that's, you know, a vision of existential hope rather than existential angst. Yeah, I, I think that um, 
Yeah, on, on this question, I think physics basically only has good news with the sole exception of the possibility of the heat death, which itself could maybe be transcended in the manner I described. It, it, it's, it, it's very good news insofar as if you read some of these, you know, these non-hopeful books like Global Catastrophic Risks or various other books in that domain, um, some of them make somewhat depressing reading some of those chapters because it's, you know, it's all about what, what man might do to man. And that's, that's somewhat concerning. But the non-depressing chapters are the physics chapters. Uh, what we discover uh, is that there really are no um, fundamental obstructions with the possible exception of the cosmological constant. But I, th I think that that is superable as well um, to us uh, exploiting the incredibly rich resources that the universe has, has sent us. There is, we know of no uh, laws of physics that prevent that, um, which suggests that it's, it's possible. Um, in terms of, you know, so, I mean, I guess the first thing is that that's, um, is a, is a non-negative, you know, we, we, we can't, there doesn't seem to be any obstruction to us doing it. Um, and all of the negative scenarios just don't seem you know, you might worry about vacuum decay. I, I, in fact, spent some early years in my career becoming the world expert on something called bubbles of nothing, which is an extremely catastrophic possibility of vacuum decay, which in which a sort of bubble appears in which not only is sort of everything dead, but in fact, space time has ceased to exist. And that expands out at the speed of light. Um, and the consequences of my investigations was that while that is sort of theoretically possible, it's in fact incredibly hard to do it like won't happen spontaneously incredibly unlikely exponentially unlikely and, and even if we wish to do it um we basically couldn't so um you know that kind of continues in the all of the negative possibilities are just incredibly uh unlikely um the positive possibilities i i think there is something to be said for dreaming about um helping us realize these visions particles that could come out of our colliders or new new physics discoveries um, that would accelerate technological progress. So just, just to give you an example, um, you know, we have to build, for example, at CERN, we built this massive collider. Um, and it was very expensive, it cost about $10 billion. And it seems as though the scaling of building ever bigger colliders is, is not, in that form, is, is not very attractive. Like, you know, to, you keep the, the cost goes like some power of the energy that you wish to reach. Um, but a actually, there are, that's only sort of subject to the laws of physics as we currently understand them. Um, it wouldn't be a great, it wouldn't be sort of revolutionary from a physics point of view if there just was some new particle that came out that we discovered that was somewhat more energetic than any of the particles we've discovered today. And it's easy to imagine particles that would really revolutionize both our ability to build bigger particle accelerators, which I guess is the thing that theoretical physicists would first go to, but also our ability to implement uh, technological progress and realize some of these things, um, it would just make it much easier. For example, you know, there's, uh, not to get too technical, but there are like particles called uh, electrons and there are other particles, which is a muon, which is sort of like a heavier version of the um, electron. Um, but the really annoying thing about muons, um, and so the great thing about muons is that first of all, they're heavier than the electrons. So you can actually accelerate them in particle colliders much, much more energetically than you can accelerate um, electrons. Uh, and also because they're much heavier than uh, electrons, there's this thing called muon catalyzed fusion where you can build a fusion reactor much more easily. Uh, where if you just replace the electrons in some fusible atom with uh, muons, then there's, because the muon is so much heavier, everything's much closer together, and it's much, much easier to get fusion to happen. Um, and those things are great, but there's a problem. And the problem is that muons decay very rapidly in a small fraction of a second. Um, and that basically, uh, you know, people dream about muon catalyzed fusion, and people also dream about muon colliders, which may maybe they will be able to do, but there's great technological obstacles, which is that uh, they decay in such a small fraction of a second that it's pretty hard to get them up to speed before they decay. And it's pretty hard to catalyze enough fusion reactions before uh, they the muon decays again. And that just means that it's kind of not really worth the cost. Um, but you could totally imagine that we could discover 
something that's heavier still and has a longer lifetime for some you know reason that that would be an important new discovery about the laws of physics but it wouldn't be a revolutionary discovery it wouldn't upend anything you know there's basically there could easily be consistent with everything we know new particles as we push to higher energies and if we discovered that we could you know we, there'll be huge numbers of technologies that would be unlocked by the by those perfectly plausible discoveries from our pass, particle accelerators um including perhaps you know from that you could make a bigger collider that would make an even bigger uh, go to reach even higher energies and you could just bootstrap yourself all the way up to the to the Planck scale and beyond um so there's plenty of possibilities for the laws of physics to be uh, uh extremely friendly from what i would consider to be an engineering perspective consistent with everything we know yeah you do you do sound both very hopeful uh but then there's so much that we don't know and so much that we can't control possibly um but i take it you do seem optimistic about the future um would you say that you are and and if so like what got you there is it uh all of the possibilities or um are the risks just too far away or i would say i am optimistic about the future um and why? I mean, so first of all, as I said, there doesn't seem to be any fundamental obstruction to being optimistic. I would say from an emotional point of view, the reason I'm optimistic is if you look at the history of the last 400 years, there is a clear positive gradient. Um, that doesn't mean this, uh, that that will continue. But just, you know, learning about the history of the last 400 years and how incredibly better things are now than they were 50, 100, 200, 400 years ago. Uh, it's pretty hard to look at that recent history and not be optimistic that technology will continue to impress, uh, progress, that you know more people will be lifted out of poverty and that we will not uh, have a sort of te techno-optimistic future. So, so one thing that we um, usually ask also in these interviews is like, um, why it seems like you mentioned some some of the you know less exciting sci-fi uh, in the sense that there it's not very excited about the future, um, which shows that people are very worried about the future. Um, it's hard for people to, you know, envision positive scenarios. Um, do you have any any guesses of why that is, and how do you think we can improve on that? I, I think, um, you know, one, I mean, I think it's easy to be optimistic. That's what I just said. And the reason it's easy to be optimistic is there, there has been so much progress in the last uh, few hundred years on just sort of all fronts, basically uh, all front progress. And I feel as though, so it doesn't really, from that point of view, require any imagination to be optimistic. Um, except to believe that current trends will continue, which is the sort of perhaps the default. Um, and maybe the way to make people optimistic is just to concentrate on great successes of the past. Um, just the huge number of inspirational things that our civilization has done. Um, and you can just take your pick from pretty much any decade in the last uh uh, last few centuries. Uh, that is maybe what I would focus on. So we're sort of backwards looking optimism for the future. Yeah, that's, it's, that's very nice. And I agree with that. And it's, you know, uh, there's a lot of literature that I guess that has come out in the past few years. That's also like been good at showcasing that, like Steven Pinker's, um, uh, enlightenment now, or, uh, I don't know, pass, 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 pass. Um, with the, uh, showing how, you know, since industrialization, it's really taken off. Um, but w in terms of that type of literature, do you have any um, recommendations for someone, you know, listening to this, getting curious? Um, and it can be uh, sci-fi, it can be movies, it can be uh, nonfiction. Do you have any reading or listen recommendations? Um, maybe I should, um, yeah, maybe I should just stick to physics on that question and just some of the great accounts of physics discoveries in the past. I, I, I think that many of the best 
books really capture the excitement of the people making the discoveries um, and are not just a sort of dry rendition of, of, of what they discover. Though that itself is a you know, pretty amazing story. Um, I tend to think Kip Thorne, uh, the uh, physicist, wrote a book called uh, Wormholes and Time Warps and Black Holes. At least two of those three words are in there. Uh, which I think is just a sort of fantastically kind of captures the excitement of uh, thinking about black holes. Um, he was one of the instrumental people in, in LIGO, and in fact won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of gravitational waves uh, a few years ago. But this is that book was written somewhat before that era. Um, I also think that Roger Penrose's Road to Reality uh, is, a, is a pretty great book. Um, that's not such a personal book but it's just a sort of fantastic compendium for people interested in physics of the um, way that this sort of phenomenal mind thinks about these topics. And it's, it's super interesting because he wrote it as a popular book for a popular audience and some parts of it, that's an apt description, but uh, I think he just doesn't realize um, the sort of, uh, I don't think he realizes how uh, phenomenal he is. And so me as a working theoretical physicist will sometimes use it as a sort of reference book. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to see sort of his his take on various advanced topics, but also it is you know it has this uh, this this element that sort of anybody can read it. So I, I I those would be major recommendations. I think those sound like great recommendations. I haven't read either of them, but I I think I will now. Um, so just backing up a bit, like uh, you've spoken about a lot of the long term risks, like the heat death of the universe, you like, bubbles of nothingness. That sounded very. Um, <laughs> Very, very doom, <laughs> doom and gloom, um, but very interesting also. Um, are there any, what are like the most undervalued risks that we need to think about right now, do you think? Um, I think that the most undervalued risks are probably not coming from physics. Um, I, I think that physics doesn't have many risks for us to worry about. The, the main thing that people do worry about in physics is before they turned on the Large Hadron Collider, this collider in, at CERN in, in Geneva, th there was some concern that uh, it would make um, various catastrophic scenarios uh, that, would, that would end the world. Um, uh, but there was you know, discussion about how likely that was. And some people said 10 to the minus 30, which seems to be uh, sort of unduly optimistic. Basically, nothing is uh, 10 to the minus 30. We don't know anything uh, with that certainty. But it does seem pretty reasonable that it was less than 10 to the minus 10. So uh, I guess it, you can run the expectation value and, and think that that's, that's useful. Um, I think the biggest risks at the moment to our continued flourishing are just the sort of somewhat uh, old school, well-documented risks of, uh, to do with biology and, uh, and some 1940s physics. And so in terms of then what, what technologies or science you need to be see be advanced the most right now, was, would that not be physics or would it be anything else? Um, well, the, I, you know, physics is nowadays, um, you know, it's kind of an exciting field, but it's not where the, uh, it's intellectually exciting, but it's been a while since advances in fundamental physics really um, impacted the cutting edge of technology. That's, I mean, depending on how you count things like the transistor and whether that's fundamental physics, but you probably have to go back to, you know, 1930s, 1940s and 40s physics with nuclear energy that at the time was, you know, the cutting edge of fundamental physics, uh, impacting, uh, in, impacting sort of day-to-day -day technology that actually has been, uh, lifting uh, the, up the human condition from a material point of view. Um, that doesn't mean that that will continue, but it, and, you know, I even outlined some possibilities where there could be breakthroughs that would have immediate impact. But uh, it is generally the case that physics is getting sort of further and further from breakthrough and fundamental physics to technological application. And that, that timescale is just stretched as, uh, as, as, Maybe as we understood more and more, better and better, the frontier has gone receded further and further away. So perhaps you have a, a bias towards suggesting physics when I ask what if someone who wants to work on like creating uh, a better future 
um, should focus on. Um, but do you have any uh, any recommendations as to someone new wanting to work on positive futures? What should they specialize in? Um, I think I there's no one size fits all uh, advice, but so it sort of depends on your aptitude and your interest. I certainly wouldn't recommend that people specialize in things that are not uh, in, interesting to them, otherwise they're unlikely to succeed. Um, I think it's plain that the current revolutions in artificial intelligence and synthetic biology are going to be, um, you know, th things that are going to be driving uh, technological progress for better or ill over the next uh, decade or so. So if you're interested in an impact on that timescale, those would be the fields that uh, uh, the consensus would tell you to go into, and I probably agree with the consensus. I appreciate your uh, your honesty uh, and for you know um, admitting your pride towards physics, um, but still, yeah. Um, so what's and this is a, a complete right turn or left turn, maybe I should say. Um, but it's the last question I'll ask. Uh, so it's more on this sort of general uh, life advice. Uh, how do I um, have an impact with my life and career? Um, but what's the best advice that you ever got personally? Ah, um, uh, well, I think probably the best advice I ever got, I didn't listen to. So I don't know whether that, that makes it good advice or not. Um, advice to somebody going into this field would be, um, I would say dive deep. Don't feel as though you need to, uh, know everything, choose one thing, uh, that particularly interests you and do a perhaps depth first, uh, approach to that. And by doing that, you can get to the frontier reasonably rapidly. You will probably at some stage want to backtrack and get the breadth as well, but that, uh, just choose something that particularly interests you, and you can soon uh, soon reach the frontier pretty quickly. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. And it's very interesting to talk to someone who's used to thinking about like such long time scales of things or like <laughs> large time scales. Um, and I think I'll hand over to Alison now to sort of uh, dig out the last uh, nuggets of wisdom from you. Well, I think um, we always uh, end with two questions um, and those are a little bit more creative. So imagine you're now in the post creative writing class. Um, but there's this one paper from Joby Ord and Owen Cotton Barrett uh, introducing the term of existential hope. And they also introduced the term of new catastrophe, which uh, we currently have a bounty out for reframing <laughs> um, because the term of new catastrophe is you know, obviously still uh, incinerating or at least like referencing a catastrophe, which usually people think of as an event that after which the expected value of the universe is lower than before. And so, you know, if you do have uh, an, a better term for a U catastrophe, then uh, please, please feel free to introduce it to us. We already had a few really, really interesting ones submitted to us from all kinds of, from all kinds of folks. But um, I think in terms of thinking about a very specific um, event, I mean, when you reference um, the introduction of the cosmological constant before that is almost like a catastrophic event to some extent because <laughs> and because in some uh, in some in some regard that really kind of like curtailed our chances for very very long term uh, survival. But if you could think of the opposite right now, like what would be a discovery? And I think you're already alluding to that uh, to some extent. Um, um, yeah, but what would be an ex a discovery after which you'd be much much more hopeful about the long term? future like one specific event like a daily life kind of thing like one discovery that you know we could make that after which you'd be like okay now we nailed it uh, i'm like can't go optimistic about the long-term future now uh okay so i guess the first thing i agree with the sentiment in your question that you catastrophe does not sound it sounds like a catastrophe that's happening to you or something i don't like i'm not a great fan of that um I mean, if you wanted to be etymologically correct, it should probably be an an anastrophe. I mean, that would be the, uh, you know, the cations and anions are opposite for each other. So if you want to go for the Greek word, but I think you'd probably also end up having to explain that word a lot. Um, I mean, we already have the word breakthrough or uh, elevation. Uh, rapture probably has too many uh, other connotations. 
um, yeah, breakthrough, but that, that's already a word. I, you, I guess you want a new word. Uh, yeah, well, those would be my recommendations. Um, and what would an, a breakthrough be? Um, I mean, there are lots of... Um, We're in a slightly strange situation where we have, for the last few hundred years, just had breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough that have risen our GDP by a certain amount each each year, and um, and continued uh, to you know lift people out of poverty and just improve the human condition, um, and so there is a certain amount of you know. Just if current trends continue, that's a miracle. And we just have, we require breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough to keep current trends to continue. And yet, uh, yeah, that would, um, to me, that would be the most inspirational thing, you know, if just current trends continue. Um, and if, you know, GDP continues to increase and global poverty continues to decrease and technology continues to advance. So uh, that I think is miracle enough. So if we now imagine a day in a life where you, we've realized this, um, what is the day in a life where we realize that we're just getting more of the same <laughs> <laughs> and continuously, yeah, um, yeah I guess it's um, a kind of breakthrough climbing civilization. You know, it, it would be difficult to actually have a day around where we realize that this is now the trajectory that we're on. One could think that that every day to some extent, but on the other hand, that would also be a day in which we know that uh, the risks are also piling up on the uh, on, on the flip side, right? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, just like the day that when we eliminated polio and uh, that, you know, the, the day when the last person is lifted out of extreme poverty, the day when... Uh, technological progress just manifests itself. I just, uh, that's the future that we should be aiming at. Okay, I like that. I think the kind of like backward, what do you call it? Backward looking optimism uh, about the future, I think is, uh, uh, is, a, is a really sweet term. Um, okay, wonderful. Well, we'll try to see whether we can create an art piece to visualize this or even a writing popular, uh, a writing from the Rosters. <laughs> Um, I think it's kind of sweet that, you know, it would just be a very, um, very, um, I think very, yeah, very, very, a, a day in a life that we are already living. And I think that it's interesting because sometimes, you know, you, you can't help but wonder what will happen in the next seven years. And sometimes I do think that in seven years or so, we will look back at this time as this time that Robin Hansen often introduced as dream time, the time where we almost um, yeah, where in hindsight, it is just kind of like dumbfounding what a great of a life we already lived. Um, and we only know when it's gone. Um, and so I think it's nice to, uh, it's nice to remind people that actually we are already living into in, in some kind of a, a really great, wonderful, not quite utopia, but about something um, very, very, very much like it, like a prototopia, I guess, how Kevin, Kel Kevin Kelly called it. Um, well, while we still have, have you here for like seven more minutes, um, I think I would love to uh, touch on a question that we had here in the chat, which is, I think, an interesting one that you also already uh, touched on a little bit um, uh, in, in your earlier points. And so um, basically one of our participants wondering um, what you think of the great stagnation in physics, uh, in particular nuclear physics, um, and if you have any other examples uh, along the lines of muon catalyzed fusion for cool technologies that might be accessible in the near future if we aim towards them. Um, <clears throat> yes, so to a certain extent, there has been, yeah, the, so the, the first question was stagnation um, in nuclear physics. Um, and I think there sort of has been a stagnation in nuclear physics, but only because we're, I will accept the premise that certain parts of physics are not making progress. Um, I think the reason those parts of physics are not making progress is because we've won. And that we understand them, and that once you understand something, uh, you, you can't, uh, you know, it, it's hard to understand it a second time. I mean, obviously we get different perspectives on things, but like you know, things things are just just done. You know, um, you know, we 
we discovered the circulation of the blood and then progress on understanding the circulation of the blood in the human body ceased because we understood it. Um, and so what it looks like for there to be a stagnation in some of these fields is that, um, is that you win and then it stagnates because you won. Um, and I would say that basically that's true in nuclear physics is that at least from a, I mean, obviously there's still nuclear engineering, lots of interesting questions there, but we basically uh, understand, I think as well as we ever will, nu nuclear physics, you know, modulo some improvements in numerical simulation techniques. Um, and similarly, yeah, we put together the standard model uh, of particle physics in the 1970s. And the thing about the particle standard model of particle physics is that it's great. It just explains everything that has ever come out of a collider for decades and decades and decades. And so um, from one point of view, that, that means you're a winner. But the downside of winning is that uh, it looks like you're not discovering anything new because you, you manage that. Um, and that's sort of why those are no longer hot topics in physics because they were sort of solved. You know, this, 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 this thing happened to topics is they're hot topics and then they're sort of solved and then people move on to other things. Um, and they could be unsolved, you know, that they'll be unsolved the day that we discover something in our colliders or in our other experiments that are, uh, that cannot be explained with the current theories. But at, at the moment, that's basically not true. There are some question marks like dark matter and uh, various other uh, topics like that, but there's nothing we've actually, you know, we haven't seen that. That's the sort of uh, interesting question. But in terms of anything that could come at, a nuclear reactor could do, I think there's basically not any anomalous uh, observations whatsoever and therefore no, no need for any complaints. Um, yeah, so then this, the second part of the question was like other things like muon catalyzed fusion. They're, yeah, I mean, they're just an endless array of potentially useful particles um, or other technology that we could discover um, that would be uh, extremely handy. You know, if, if we could discover some new, if it not a particle, like a string that was uh, manufacturable, uh, that had incredible strength, there is a you know, a, a limit that nature provides on um, how strong materials can be. Um, but that limit is nowhere near that, you know, carbon nanotubes are sort of famously strong thing is sort of 10 to the, about a billion fold away from that limit, more than a billion fold actually. Um, and so that's another example of something that if we could do it, and there's no fundamental reason that we couldn't, that it couldn't be something that if we just tune up our particle accelerators a little more, we could discover, or, or it doesn't have to be particle accelerators. There are other ways to experimentally to discover things about the universe, um, that that would be an extremely useful uh, technology. I mean, that, that could be something with immediate technological applications. Okay, well, that's a great, uh... Uh, that's a great um, uh, recipe. And I think the participant is satisfied. He says, love the nanotube example. <laughs> so at least, uh, at least you got that there. Um, all right. Well, I think that uh, is also, I think, an interesting, actually action-oriented bit on like what people could actually um, look into, you know, if they were looking for any things to, um, to wrap their head around. Um, very cool. Okay. Are there any specific bits that you think we should have discussed that um, didn't? This is... Any open questions that you want to pose? No, good. Um, wonderful. Well, we're getting uh, many, many, uh, I think, uh, like the mm -hmm. um, lots of encouragement here in the chat. So really, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, thank you so, so much for your time, Adam. Um, this was wonderful. Um, and we will be in touch afterwards with video uh, and uh, with an art work uh, dedicated to, uh, I guess, more of the same for a very, very long time until the heat death of the universe strikes or we will have solved it. <laughs> so thanks everyone for joining. This was really lovely. I hope you all have a lovely Friday and uh, thank you Adam for joining us. And it's never like, I think we almost had no overlap with the discussion that we had with Creon and you, which is I think kind of very interesting and I had expected there to be more, but it, you seem to be a waterfall of more positive, hopeful visions. So um, if you come up with one of these again, then please let us know. <laughs> we'll definitely have, I think, uh, an audience that cherishes them a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful uh, weekend. Uh, thanks um, for, for joining us today, Adam. Thank you, Alison. Bye-bye.